The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Finally, after three weeks, we get a story about the birth of Jesus. <laughs> it took a while. It's so close. One of the things that I do to prepare for uh, my sermons is there's a, a preacher's guide from Sundays and Seasons that gives different perspectives on the readings for that particular week. And the one that's written from a preacher to preachers is, don't start talking about Christmas Eve yet. It's not there yet. Mm -hmm. Try not to have this confluence of fourth Sunday of Advent and Christmas Eve come together, separate those two things out. And I'm like, yes. And then I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> and the, the, Themes that we have for the season of Advent necessarily, well, find more fulfillment in the actuality of the birth of Christ than they do in the waiting and anticipating. And there's that minor detail that it happened 2,000 years ago. It's already happened. What is it that we're waiting for? But I understand to a certain degree why we have this period of anticipation and preparation for what is to come just in a few short hours. Um, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves like our retailers and start putting up Christmas decorations in, I don't know, like August now? Uh, that there is something in the waiting. There is something in the anticipation. And it does reflect to a large degree this idea of the kingdom of God. It, it's, it's here, but it's not quite yet fulfilled. There is this period of waiting. And the stories that accompany this day, perhaps except the Romans, uh, three verses from Romans, the story about David and, and the story of Mary, there is a period of waiting. David wanted to build this glorious temple um, as a tribute uh, to God, as for gratitude for all that God had done for him, and also a, as a place, respectable place, for the Ark of the Covenant to be housed. Um, David had built, by this point, a extravagant palace for himself and for his family members, uh, because God had instructed him to do so, but he felt like God should have something as well. Um, and the Ark of the Covenant representing the presence of God wanting to have an appropriate building or place where God could be present. 
But there was going to be a time of waiting because you didn't throw buildings up like that in a very short period of time. And God also told David, that's a great idea. I love it, but you're not going to be the one to do it. Uh, we'll let your son do that. Well, and then Mary, her story, of course. Really, I mean, you've heard that story. You hear it every Christmas Eve or fourth Sunday of Advent, I guess it's to say. Uh, and perhaps if you read Luke's gospel on a regular basis, you read that story and it becomes somewhat normalized. It's not. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary story. From Mary's perspective, from her family's perspective, from her culture's perspective, from our perspective, not from God's perspective, because nothing is impossible for God, but a teenage girl betrothed to Joseph is told that she is going to give birth to the Son of God. She was perplexed by this <laughs> Maybe a bit of an understatement. <laughs> perplexed, really. But even in those few short verses, something extraordinary is revealed about Mary. Not much is written about her. She does pop in and out of the Gospels throughout the story from this story until her son's crucifixion, but she didn't really ask for clarification except for that one question about, well, I haven't really, you know, keep it PG. Um, how is this even possible? And then the angel says, well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Oh, well, that totally makes sense then. Yes, <laughs> let's do this thing, right? <laughs> I wondered as I thought about this, as I prayed about it and, and read through this story a number of times, if Mary knew what the next 30 plus years would be like with this son, would she still have said yes? Would she still have been so agreeable, bless you, to be the one to bear the Savior of the world? Don't have an answer to that question. Her faithfulness, her trust in God is certainly worthy to be lauded and celebrated. Who among us has that kind of trust, belief, faith? To believe in something so unbelievable, it's only happened once in the history of humankind and the history of all of creation. And I still wonder and will always wonder what was it that made her so receptive and so willing to do this? Especially considering the times. There was not yet in the presence of the Holy Spirit, obviously, because Christ did not yet come. And relationship with God at that point in time and from that point previous all the way back to the time of the Garden of Eden had been complicated. God made himself known in a variety of ways to his people Sometimes, oftentimes, in overwhelming fashion. Sometimes in violent ways. Power on display that spoke, well, of the power and authority of God. But in some ways, still a distance. As the Ark of the Covenant remained behind a curtain that is thought to have been three feet thick. Woven. I don't know, three feet thick as a barrier to keep people from entering into that space known as the Holy of Holies. There was always something that kept humans at a distance save for the high priest who once a year was allowed to go in and be in the presence of this holy God. Relationship was complicated. 
Today's theme is about a relationship. It's joy. In my annual lesson on what joy is, uh, does anybody want to remind me what it is and what it's not? It's not happiness. It is not happiness. It's not circumstantial. It's not circumstantial. All right. You all were thinking that. Jonna's just yep. great. <laughs> <laughs> she has a boldness. And she's wearing a joy shirt. Yeah. So yeah. she it's must. <laughs> And she's absolutely right. Joy in a biblical sense and in a spiritual and religious sense, it is not circumstantial. It is not about happiness. It is not about what's happening in our life in any way, shape, or form. It is about the relationship that we have with our Creator. It is the relationship that we have with our Savior. And in these stories of David and of Mary, it is always God who is the initiator, the one who comes to them. David very excited to build this house, and God says, yay, that's great, David. But let me tell you what I'm going to do for you. And at that point, establishing a covenant with David that would be everlasting. That a descendant of his would sit on a throne of majesty and rule over all of creation. And of course, we know who that is. And God comes to Mary through the angel Gabriel and chooses her. It is in that choosing, that initiating, that God does for us that creates that possibility for a relationship that has a level of intimacy that neither Mary or any of her contemporaries or any that came before her could have ever possibly imagined. And yet God comes to us, not yet. <laughs> But he does. And though we do not have an extraordinary story like Mary or like David or any of the other iconic people in all of Scripture, God widened the scope of the potential for joy for all of humanity by sending his Son in the likeness of us broken humans, but being perfect in every way. And I've always thought of that, this concept of the Incarnation, not as much for the sake of the cross and for salvation, but for the sake of revealing to us several things about who God is, but also to make Him super relatable, at least in a way that humans can understand another human being. Because it was God, again, doing something unexplainable and extraordinary to be the initiator of a relationship with each and every one of us. And that's the power of the birth of our Savior, is the impact of it continues on even to today. That though that happened 2,000 years ago, in every moment, in every time, in every point in our life when things are great or when things are difficult, when the circumstances aren't perfect and we're not feeling the happiness and joy, we can be assured that Christ comes to us in all of the fullness of God and choosing us, choosing to have that opportunity to know God and to be known by God. It is absolutely extraordinary. And it is unexplainable. And it is certainly a reason for us to celebrate, to give thanks, to sing praises to our God because God desires to have a relationship with each and every one of us. When I think of the things that I've done and who I am, <clears throat> I'm not perfect. But that God chose me in the same way that he chose Mary and David and some of these other folks, it is 
life-altering. And it happens again and again and again. In the good times, in the hard times, in the everything in between times, to be reminded that he chose us. That's why the font is always present. To be reminded of his choosing. It's why we set a table every Sunday. To be reminded that he chooses us over everything else, including, yes, his own life. It's hard not to include all of that in the story of our faith who we are in God because it is all a part of it and you can't separate out the waiting for and he hasn't been born yet and he doesn't go to a cross or rise from a tomb I'm sorry I'm not that good I can't separate those things out because they are all a part of that story of God choosing each and every one of us whether you experience whether you feel whether it seems real or not, it is there. The joy is there simply in the choosing, simply in the coming, in the rising, in the dying, in the living of the one who is and was and always will be the Son of God. 